so much. Uh, so thank you very much, Francoise. Thank you very much to Stephanie and to all the other organizers. And in particular, thanks to Nick, I guess. We wouldn't be here except for him. And this may sound like it's a very um, serious talk with a serious title, but it is somewhat in the style of what Margaret has just presented. I hope that, um, ah, I put a few more equations in, I should say, Margaret, but, um, but otherwise it's uh, useful. So um, I thought I'd start with a little bit of history. So we've seen from Sven, you know, pictures of a family and so on, which I, I certainly didn't have, but I've been digging through all my old photographs um, and looking at, you know, what silver oxide did for us back in the day before there were digital things and seeing if I can come up with things. And so I thought I, thought I would go back and you'll see some pictures of, of some, some of the things. Um, so Nick and I happen to be about similar age. I'm a little older. Um, and I guess I'm talking about history methods. That's sort of the, the theme because that's what I've been interested in for much of my life. And I'm just trying to give some idea, perhaps again to the younger people, to, to see where we were when 1984. This is the year I did my PhD, actually, one year before Nick finished, but it's a it's an important year in this thing. So the state of iterative methods, I mean, this is just one area of numerical analysis, right? It's conjugate gradients that existed for a long time. Okay. But only through work by John Reed, had it actually recently been considered an iterative method rather than the direct method. So, so yeah, this may seem strange to the young students, I guess, but it was not considered an iterative method. So that was for symmetric and positive definite systems, min resonance MLQ for indefinite systems and LSQ for normal equations due to Chris Page and Michael Saunders existed in 1984, but not yet GM res and by CG staff and all these other things that are just routine in, in, in what we do these days, right? I'm astonished how many references there are to GMRs as if it's a completely classical method <laughs> when when I started out, it didn't exist. I mean, it's, it's the roots of Joseph Saad's mind. Preconditioning did exist. Preconditioning meant doing incomplete triangular factorizations. And that was due to a very influential paper by Goose Meyerink and Henk van der Voorst which eventually appeared in 1976, but was actually written quite a lot earlier. So this should work. Is that right, Frank? Is it right? Okay. So that's the, um, that's, that's where, where, where sort of, I came into the scene and, and you'll see that Nick is gonna appear as well. So, so that's when I started my academic career against this background. I wanted to broaden this set of solver techniques in particular for the, the finite element equations that would recently become quite popular for the solution of PD. Okay, so 1984, I proved an eigenvalue bound for certain finite element mass matrices that immediately implied past conjugate gradient convergence. And that was a way to get Jean Gould to invite you to Stanford in 1984. So Jean came through Reading where I did my PhD and he invited me to Stanford when I finished. And I finished in 1984 and I flew to California two weeks after I did my oral exam. That summer, Jean had also invited, as you've already heard, a young graduate student from Manchester. Um, and uh, I remember also going to the SIAM annual meeting in Seattle in 1984. But I didn't remember you came through there, Nick. I thought that we went there later rather than that. But I, 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 my memory was of meeting Nick for the first time, even though we come from very nearby places in San so the first time in Palo Alto on the, on the evening of his arrival in, in Stanford. And that summer, I remember many Chinese meals out, um, which anybody who knew Jean will, will, will associate with. Uh, and uh, little else, actually. I do remember that Nick had results on the polar decomposition. He can fill in the details here, I should say. I, I, this is my vague memory of what, what happened. And uh, uh, matrix nearness problems, you've seen that was a very uh, interesting thing that was subject to his thesis, essentially. And a new iteration that involved a matrix inverse. This is the thing that appealed to Gene the most somehow, I think, because he thought you never do inverses, right? So you never do inverses. And so um, this iteration that involved a matrix inverse was a very exotic object in a certain sense. I can't remember what it was for, Nick. What was, what was the context in this? Um, well, the nearest orthogonal matrix, I suppose. Oh, it was the nearest orthogonal matrix, okay. And Rob Schreiber was there and was very interested in that. He was. was. The first time I talked about it. Yeah, right. I guess uh, one thing that I, only in synthesis did I realize is, of course, Nick 
as you've all heard, was a, a you know as a, a product of, of Manchester. There's no doubt about it. It's completely associated with this place. And at that time, Manchester was famous for ordinary differential equations. Actually, it was the centre in the United Kingdom for ordinary differential equations. No question. And uh, and I came from Reading, and Reading was the centre for PDEs, partial differential equations. But actually, we were both doing linear algebra at this time, and that was, that was, that's sort of the truth. I mean, that's the way it was. Um, so it's so not all just words, but anyway, um, I got a lecture when I came back from Stanford at Bristol University, and all my lectures have all started on the first of April. So it's always been a joke, you know. It's always been <laughs> anyway. anyway, Nick got a lectureship at Manchester sometime around that time. I'm not sure. Was that eighty five? Eighty five. Okay, so there you go. April eighty five. Same. Um, and so I guess <laughs> you know, there's two young guys from. The northwest of England, because I'm from Merseyside and Nick's obviously from Manchester. You know, um, we started our academic careers about the same time, and we were sort of both doing numerical linear algebra, but we had nobody sort of really else to talk to who did numerical linear algebra in a certain sense. It was rather strange. Um, and so, um, whenever a conference came up, very often I would contact Nick or Nick would contact me, and we would arrange to share a twin bedroom. It was just a way of keeping our costs down. So, th so this is a um, what happened? 1986, I remember. Um, there's at that time there was a every 10 years there was a state of the art in numerical analysis meeting, and in 1986 this was held at Birmingham. And uh, I remember this meeting because I met Jim Wilkinson. It's the only time I met Jim Wilkinson in a lift, as it says here. We were all staying in this big tall building on the campus, which has since been um, condemned. <laughs> But anyway, I met Jim Wilkinson in a lift, but I think Nick never did, if I understand. Is no, that? I did. Oh, you did? Oh. I've even better one. I met Jim at a conference at the University of Lancaster in the gents' toilet. Oh, right. There you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't realize that. So, so that's that, partly why I put some of these questions in to see if. Okay. Okay. So over the next uh, three years, I guess, 86, 89. I sort of became convinced that we, we needed good preconditioners to get fast solutions of these finite element equations. And so I, I met David Sylvester at um, a meeting at Brunel, the math lab finite element meeting, and we started working together. And I guess the only point about this here is that I became a fairly frequent visitor to, to Manchester. I've been actually standing on the stage many times. I've been here many times, and especially in those early years, I guess it was a great thing to be able to come. Uh, well, there's, there's still, but I mean, I, at that time it was wonderful to. Have these people to interact with. In 1989, um, I had my first sabbatical and I went to Stanford again. And this was the other, Nick was also on sabbatical, if I understand, and he was living in Charlie's house. So where's Charlie? Charlie's right there back there. So I, I know your house actually, Charlie, because I've lived there in for a week or so in, in, in 1989. Um, I remember it was cold. So many of the photos um, that you'll see Unfortunately, Nick is such a good photographer, as, as, we, as we've heard, that he's used to the guy behind the lens and not in front of it. So this is me in front of one of the frozen waterfalls that I'm sent back to one hour. And I do remember um, the music that Sven referred to, because Nick had, not, I mean, had Charlie's house, which was a big house for a single guy, I guess, I mean, at that time, but he'd hired an electric organ. And so I remember the morning of my talk, I woke up and Nick was playing the organ and it was very nice to, 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 to hear this different side of, of, of um, 1991, uh, David was visiting Jean, David over here was visiting Jean at Stanford. And I joined them and that was somehow a breakthrough time for us because we sat in a little office in Margaret Jack's Hall and we worked out something to do with the solution of Stokes equations that turned out to be quite important and opened up a lot of other things to do with um, work on saddle point systems and so on. And this is beautifully summarized by Michaela Benzi, Jean Golub, and Jörg Gleason in their article in Act in America. Anyway, so it's a time when we started really working on indefinite problems, I guess, really in earnest. You know, at that time, I went to various people who had uh, sort of libraries of solvers and, and I said, oh, can, can I have preconditioned minres? And I remember like Steve Ashby had you know, it pack or whatever. I said, what on earth do you want that for? You know, it just hadn't ever made it. It didn't, didn't exist as a thing, you know, because they'd never thought of it, but we used it for sure. That's what we wanted to solve our problems. 
1993, I guess, uh, was my first householder meeting, Gatlin Burger Group, kind of, not Nick's first. But I do remember distinctly that we shared a cabin because Lake Arrow had had this, um, it's a U UCLA conference center at that time, and they had these little huts with an upstairs and a downstairs. And so uh, I was in the upstairs room and Nick was in the downstairs room. And so we were sharing at another conference as we'd done for a number of times. I didn't find any picture of that. Now, I couldn't even find a picture of the type of hut. I think they've, they've destroyed them all by now. So that was unfortunate. This is the um, meeting. This is one of the photographs, rather grainy, I'm afraid it's what it's like, from the householder meeting in Lake Arrowhead. And what's important is that this is Alston Householder. So Alston Householder was living in Malibu at that time. He was an old man. He was driven up by his wife, Heidi, up to the householder meeting. And here he is with Martin Gutknecht and Walter Gander, who are organizing the next meeting. Um, and that's the photo you sort of can find if you, if you look for the, this thing. But here's another photo for which I'm very grateful to Michaela Benzi. And this is about one of the only photos I have of Nick Hyam. Can anybody see him? You can, in the red shirt. <laughs> you made <just> you see that. <laughs> and I think this is Alston Householder. So you may, I thought you didn't meet Jim Wilkinson, but you certainly met Alston Householder. Uh, so here's Nick here. I, I think this is David Young, David M. Young. And gosh, I think this is Roy Mathias. Are you oh, stand the eyes that is that okay okay uh but anyway this is uh this is certainly arrowhead and and this, this i'm pretty sure this is you know this is uh i'm sorry it's not a full frontal it's very difficult to find photos of nick except where he's behind the lens that's the thing right? um so 1993 to 96 uh, and mineral results with who with david and with ben fisher and 1996 next householder meeting comes around and this is in Pontresina, switzerland so i asked nick again sort of thing can we, can we share a room in Pontresina? and this is the uh, the photograph from Pontresina, and of course you you know what happened um around this time which is the pointer brown in the middle one is that right? okay okay so this young french lady here had unfortunately stolen his heart so and also my roommate so so uh, <laughs> So anyway, so here's Fran and here's Nick, I guess, here uh, in, in the back row. And who's missing in this photograph? Oh, uh, the yes, Velka Hahn is here, right? So, I mean, Charlie's here. I mean, several people. I mean, I'm sure people can recognize themselves on here, right? I think this is um, Coburn Skyra, isn't it? That's right. And um, Pete Stewart, you know, I mean, there's a number of people on this, on this photo. Um, but who's missing? No, no, Nick's here. I pointed out Nick. Nick's, Nick's over here. That's Nick. Yeah, so Gene looks as if he's missing, but in fact, no, he was just in one of his moves. He's hiding at the back there. There's Gene. That's Gene Gullard. Hiding at the back because he wasn't, wasn't one of his scenes. Where are you? Huh? Where are you? Uh, I'm somewhere here. That's me there. And next to Olive Vidlin. And Paul must be in this photograph somewhere as well. I can't see where, but you can find this this photo I just took from the web. And Michaela Benzi. There's Alex Yedemin. I don't know if anybody remembers him. <laughs> he, he because I remember him. Yes. Uh, during the war. Oh really? Yeah. Maybe what I I can't see. Anyway, I'm sorry. It's the best. The best quality I could get of this rather these are, I'll say these are old <laughs> silver oxide pictures. They're not they're not sort of modern digital things we can <laughs> anyway. That was the, the Pontresina meeting. Um, um and of course, you know, from that meeting with the young French lady, the rest is history. I, I'm sorry, Tom, if I embarrass you with this photograph. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly the year of this, but it's um you will know, is this the early 90s? The, Late 90s now, 2000, okay. Hmm? 2004. 2004, okay. Okay, so I guess my story goes on 97 to 2005. I worked on non Navier Stokes, non symmetric preconditioner with David and with Howard Elman. And uh, as so often, you know, Nick is the guy behind the lens. So this is a picture. Oh, sorry. 
this is a picture he took of um, the uh, David and Howard and myself at Manchester in, in 2003, I think. And, um, and you sent me this black and white photo. I, 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 you must have decided to actually, hmm? what's that, sorry? You, you sent it, I've not changed the colors. This, you sent me this as a black and white photo in this time thing. That's it, so, and you can see how much booze was drunk at these meetings. It's really uh, shocking, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, um, I finally thought of, I found a picture of Hyam. And then unfortunately I realized it was the wrong one. Uh, so, so this is a photo taken by, by Nick. Again, he's behind the lens. Um, this is just after the Dundee conference in, I think, 97. Uh, yes, I think it's off road, but it was just after the Dundee yeah. meeting because I was waiting for the sleeper train yeah. and Nick and Des kept me entertained, <laughs> very entertained. <laughs> so that's Des. Um, okay, so that's the sort of end of my pictures, I guess. I, I, I thought I would not go beyond the, the 90s um, because others know more about what Nick has done in more recent times, but perhaps I have a slightly uh, different take on the, on the early years. So I thought I would put in some mathematics, if that's okay, and uh, and I'd say a little bit about um, non-symmetric frequent frequency and non-symmetric systems, which remains very much a research um, area. So I think it's something we try to make advances of. And there's a big difficulty here, and that is that things like GMRs we simply don't really understand why they converge. So that's that's our big difficulty. So we can't tune preconditions to, to satisfy the criteria we think work, and so on. So there are some advances, and I. Thought I'd say a little bit. So this is iterative methods in a nutshell. For those who don't know them, you generate a sequence of iterates. That's why it's called an iterative method. You have a matrix B, and so you generate a Krilov subspace by just taking powers, just doing multi matrix multiplication. If you can only matrix multiply, then you want to use a Krilov subspace method. You build this Krilov subspace, and so B squared is really B on B of R. So you do one matrix iteration, matrix vector product. You then necessarily build up you know, polynomials in B on R0, and then you get this bound for the residuals. So the residuals are just what's left, what's left over, you know, with this iterate. And so this is just the this is if B is diagonalizable. And so here you have something which just involves the eigenvalues. And so if X is an orthogonal matrix, as it is whenever B is symmetric, then these norms are clearly irrelevant and so you get something that depends only on eigenvalues and it's very well known that if you have well distributed clustered eigenvalues you get fast convergence for symmetric matrices so that's iteration methods in an absolute nutshell in a certain sense um, but i thought as i was in manchester and i regarded manchester always the home of ordinary differential equations uh, that i should say something about um, linear algebra and differential equations so let's solve a very complicated differential equation. Here we are, right? So this is a differential equation. Here's a, an initial value. So this is a perfectly valid problem. It's well posed. It's an initial value problem. Uh, I'm going to discretize with a very, very simple method. Here's the time derivative. You can see here, k is the time sets. And I've just done a theta method. So theta equals one, this is an implicit Euler. If theta equals zero, it's an explicit Euler method. And anyway, you can write down these equations. And here they are. Y1, Y2, these are the solution, all L time steps. And here's the initial value that we've got from here. And the matrix B, right? That's what you want to get to is a matrix. And here's a matrix. And this matrix is, well, it's triangular and bidiagonal, right? And the B and C are just these two numbers. So this is a bidiagonal tuplets matrix. And so everybody knows why you just do forward substitution on such a matrix. And if you do forward substitution, that's exactly the same as well, just treating this as a formula. Uh, sorry, treating this as a formula and doing this sequentially for k equals one and then for k equals two and then and so on. And the snag with that is that that's an entirely sequential process, right? And that reflects something that my colleagues in applied math think is absolutely innate and that is causality. You can't know what happens tomorrow until you know what happens today. Right? And well, okay, the same issue arises for iteration because if you have this bidiagonal matrix and you have just this initial value, then your first vector, remember you're building a Krill space, your first vector has only its first entry non zero. Then because B is like this, the second vector only has its first two entries non zero, and so on. And so YK, your kth iterate, has only its first K entries non zero, and all the rest is zero. But the solution of y prime equals a y 
we all know is an exponential. No? And an exponential is non-zero for every time step. Right? And so what's happening here is you precisely get the exact solution up to k times the time step at the kth iteration, zero for all other time steps. So this is causality again. So iteration methods don't get around causality. Right? The solution, you need the solution, you still have to take L steps to get to the solution. Whereas if you precondition, you can get around causality. And the idea is we essentially solve a nearby problem, a periodic problem, something that starts at time naught and just wraps around in time. And by doing that, that means you involve the Fourier transform because you're essentially doing circular matrices. You get diagonalizability, you get convergence independent of the number of time steps. And so this gives you what's so-called the parallel in time approach. So there's a workshop next week. That's my next conference. <laughs> it's next week in Lumini in Marseille, and that's uh, on parallel in time methods. And this is an approach for parallel in time. This involves minres. It involves the so-called Poisson and Watson flip for getting symmetry, and it involves the absolute value circular for positive definite. But these are de these are details. This is what happens. You've got whatever your number of time steps. It does the condition of it, these are not bad matrices. The iteration is. So if you can do all these different pieces in parallel, you have a parallel in time method. Thank you very much for listening to me. Happy birthday, Nick.